Good. Well, thanks. Thanks for the help. Yeah. So uh, I'm. Um, One more moment for technical difficulties. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, I get to tell you guys uh, a bit about galactic black hole and neutron star systems. And myself, most of my work has been on galactic flat holes. That's what I did my PhD on. Um, for my uh, research, I mostly explore galactic flat hole systems with uh, NICER and NUSTAR and similar instruments. Um, and I'd like to give you a little flavor of these systems uh, in these couple of talks. So uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is just introduce you to X-ray binaries, give you a little overview of these systems, um, telling you about how we, some of the nomenclature for how we describe them, distinguish them. Um, some of the taxonomy is a little bit dry, but it, it's a, a language that is necessary to be familiar with to sort of engage with the science of these systems. Uh, and then we'll get into more fun stuff, talking about a little bit about how these are formed, how we discover these systems. Um, I'll tell you about how we measure their masses um, and uh, talk a little bit about accretion uh, spectral states and jets. And Dan gave a really fantastic overview of a lot of the physics that this sort of underpins this. So that's, that's much appreciated. Um, in my next lecture, I'll get more into some, some topics that you've heard about from Dan today, like reflection, we'll, we'll speak a bit about. Um, but to begin, I want to give you just a, a vision of what a typical X ray binary system looks like. So we have a compact object, which is in, uh, being uh, poured onto by an accretion disk that is funneling matter from some close by companion star. Uh, this companion star is, is leaking uh, into what wants to be uh, a ring orbit, but this disk forces within that ring spread it out both inwards and outwards into a disk. And as that funnels matter onto the compact source, you can get outbursts. If it's a neutron star, you can get thermonuclear bursts, um, and you can get uh, brilliant jets. So if you had, uh, you know, an infinitely good optical telescope, presumably you would see something that looked a bit like this. Um, but if you had a perfectly good X-ray telescope, what you would see is a point smaller than this pointer here, right in the center, because all of the emission that comes from these systems in X-rays is really coming from the innermost hundreds, maybe thousands of kilometers compared to these scales of millions of kilometers. Okay, so now to bring you into some of the taxonomy of these systems, there are a number, number of dichotomies when discussing X-ray binaries. So we have uh, neutron stars and black holes. We also have high mass X-ray binaries and low mass X-ray binaries. Um, and more uh, in terms of the physical mechanisms, uh, we distinguish between systems which are wind fed versus those that are powered by Roche globe overflow. Uh, and, and, and furthermore, we distinguish between persistent and transient systems. Uh, so this is a long laundry list, um, but to a large extent, these are very um, closely correlated items with one another. So uh, I, I want to emphasize that these are associations only. There are exceptions where something might be uh, say, low mass but wind fed and, and vice versa. So some things jump across, but in general, high mass systems tend to also be wind fed and persistent. And in general, low mass extra binary systems tend to be fueled by Roche lobe overflow and be transient. Um, now, the sort of a mundane difference between black holes and neutron stars is that a neutron star has a surface. That's, uh, of course, trivial and obvious, but it has very important consequences for us as observers when we are trying to distinguish between uh, when we have a new X-ray source in the sky, we want to distinguish, is this a black hole system or is this a neutron star? So important consequences of having a surface is that the neutron star, unlike a black hole, can also harbor very strong magnetic fields. Um, this allows it to produce 
uh, thermonuclear bursts and, and uh, well, it, this allows it to produce pulsations, uh, but also the surface allows for the presence of thermonuclear bursts. Um, likewise, having a surface means that uh, matter that is streaming in and, 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 and hits the surface also heats it. So there's extra thermal emission that comes from having the surface, whereas for the black hole, it simply gets followed by the horizon. Um, and uh, the corollary to that is that uh, neutron stars will emit more than a black hole for a given mass accretion rate. And that's, again, because that matter, when it falls onto the neutron star surface, has to uh, produce consequential thermal emission. Um, Another important distinguishing characteristic is that black holes can have very high spin rates. So as, as Dan mentioned, they can have spins essentially up to one. This is out of reach for a neutron star. The most extreme uh, equations of state, if you, if you push the theory of uh, the structure of a neutron star to its limit, you can only manage to spin uh, one of these models up to about 1,500 hertz. That's a dimensionless spin of 0.7. And in general, we find and expect that most neutron stars have spins much below this rate. Okay. Uh, and, and just to show you some of the early evidence for um, <laughs> the existence of a horizon, before we had a beautiful image from the Event Horizon Telescope that proved with the shadow that is beyond doubt um, that black holes are real and exist in nature. Um, one of the early pieces of evidence was that in Quiescence, black holes, even though harboring much more massive um, compact objects than their neutron star counterparts, are preferentially fainter than the neutron stars. This is for the same reason I just described that the, the neutron star surface emits and the black hole does not have such surface emission. Um, I mentioned bursts. So neutron stars, um, when they uh, accrete at uh, it relatively intermediate or low rates um, produce a kind of thermonuclear sputtering. So this is sort of like, I guess, when you're trying to get a, a car going and you hear a puck, 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 as the engine is firing up, you have gas that falls onto the neutron star. And when it reaches a threshold, it will ignite a, a burst of emission lasting some seconds to minutes. And that will repeat once enough more gas supplies. So these type one uh, X-ray bursts are, are very commonplace in neutron stars and are a distinguishing characteristic. So if you see a new transient and you see bursts or if you see pulsations, you know you have a neutron star and not a black hole. Um, into the characteristics of high mass versus low mass X-ray binaries, um, contrary to what you might intuitively expect that high mass means a black hole, low mass means a neutron star, this is really distinguished based upon the companion star. So a high mass X-ray binary has a very, very massive companion star, a low mass X-ray binary, a low mass companion star. Uh, so the sort of A and hotter is the dividing line to make something high mass instead of low mass. Um, and, and I'll just point out that there are a number of systems which sort of straddle this line. Uh, so a, a few, a couple of solar mass companions, you know, here's a, a handful of systems, LNC X3, 4U1543, or X1, that are sort of, you know, you, you, you could justifiably put them on high mass or low mass side. Um, uh, and it's kind of a, a, a relatively loose distinction. But um, with that said, the sort of characteristic picture you should have in your mind, if someone says, I have detected a high mass extra binary system, you should picture some 10 or more solar mass companion star, which is emitting powerful winds, and those winds are being captured by the compact source fueling it. So in general, we're talking about O to B giants. Um, importantly, uh, as a consequence of, of these very massive companion stars, often the optical emission far dominates the extra emission. Um, these systems are essentially persistent because these winds are persistently fueling the source. By contrast, Roche flow overflow uh, uh, systems tend to be transient in nature. So uh, uh, this is where a companion star is close enough that it is fully distorted into a teardrop shape, filling its Roche flow, pouring matter into 
a disk, and that disk undergoes intermittent instabilities, um, uh, causing sort of a catastrophic cascade of disk gas onto the black hole or onto the compact object black hole. Sorry, um, we're usually talking about a K to N dwarf companion star, uh, and here the optical emission is several orders of magnitude below the X-ray emission. Uh, and just to give you a flavor for you know what it means that something is persistent versus transient, perhaps that's obvious, but um, to show this is uh, SIGX1 as seen by the Allstein monitor on RXDE. Uh, and this is a view of uh, a transient black hole system, XDD 1550. Where you see SIGX1 is, is always bright, varying within a factor of five or something. But uh, XDD 1550 changes by many orders of magnitude. It's essentially undetectable. Um, and in fact, following with uh, sharper observatories like Chandra, we see that um, in periods of deep quiescence, which is most of the lifetime for these transient systems, they're actually fainter by something like six to eight orders of magnitude uh, when they're in quiescence. And then they undergo these outbursts that bring them to the Eddington limit and then back down again. And these occur over a time scale of something like a year, six months, um, and don't occur again for many years, typically. Okay, so that's the broad brush overview of X-ray binary systems. Um, I want to now turn to where and how do these systems form, at least schematically speaking, and, and talk a little bit about how we discover these systems. So this is a picture of a stellar nursery, in this case, uh, NGC 2244, in which you see uh, you know, a beautiful nebula of gas um, and bright O and B stars that are formed, uh, new, newly born stars. And of course, we know that stars, uh, the more massive they are, they live fast, they die young, and uh, they go out in uh, very powerful supernova explosions. Um, and from these supernova explosions, um, we think that the Milky Way has produced some, something of order 100 million black holes. This is a very uncertain number. Uh, and we expect that there's something like a factor of 10 more neutron stars than black holes roaming around our galaxy. Um, the general map for how this occurs is something that should be uh, familiar to all of you. But uh, essentially, the more massive the star, um, it goes through um, more extreme phases in its uh, post main sequence life and undergoes a, a, a more violent explosion. So the most massive stars we think are likely to form black holes. Um, these are generally more than several tens of solar masses, uh, the, the progenitors that is. For stars that start off in sort of the eight to several tens of solar mass range, uh, we think this will likely produce a neutron star. Uh, but I will also just comment that if you look at the details of models by, for instance, Stan Woosley and others, um, it, these are not strict rules. It, it looks like there are different mechanisms that can occur in, in different mass windows. So this is um, really schematic only. But in any case, this is the, the roadmap for how we think stellar evolution evolves to produce neutron stars and black holes. And, and I'd like to now just briefly comment that um, a black hole is really an inevitable consequence of having sufficiently massive stars. Um, the reason is that um, the way that you save off nature forming black holes is you have some pressure that resists the pull of gravity. So um, happily here, electromagnetic forces are keeping Earth uh, beneath our feet and not um, crushing uh, Earth into a, a black hole. That's very fortunate. Um, of course, we know if you squeeze further, you'll end up with uh, electron degeneracy supported white dwarf. If you squeeze that further, you'll end up with um, a, a neutron degeneracy pressure supported neutron star. Uh, and so the schematic for how this proceeds looks something like this, where you have uh, a term here for pressure support that goes like uh, mass over R squared. The problem is that when you correct um, the Newtonian description of this for relativity, the pressure support also adds mass. 
So eventually, when you try to stave off gravity, at some point, you are contributing to your own demise. So at some sufficient mass, an object will uh, that is trying to withstand the force of gravity is by its own pressure, in fact, contributing to the inevitable march of gravity forward. So at some point, gravity wins, and you end up with a black hole. If you want to invoke extra pressure supports, um, you know, quark stars and the like, eventually they will also succumb to the same thing. So this is a sort of wild consequence of general relativity. Um, turning now uh, quickly to sort of a, a picture of uh, how this evolution takes place. Again, a, a very cartoonish view. We think what happens is um, in some cluster of stars, the progenitor system for what becomes an X-ray binary is, is likely there are two large, massive stars that are in a binary together. So two OV main sequence stars, for instance. Now, as uh, the more massive one evolves, it will uh, end up overfilling its growth lobe, and eventually um, it will uh, pour matter onto its companion, undergo a supernova explosion. And in the, in, in the course of that supernova explosion, it can receive a kick. Now, I want to pause and do a, a quick quiz for the audience. If we had 20 solar masses of star that explodes in a supernova and it loses, and say, uh, in this case, we'll pretend a one solar mass companion. Let's say that it loses 12 solar masses of material in uh, its explosion just from the supernova. What happens to the binary? Can anyone? Elliptical orbit. Elliptical orbit. Elliptical orbit. A good guess. Anyone else? If you lose more than half the total mass, you necessarily unbind the binary. So you've lost more than the binding energy of the system itself. So this is called a, a Blau kick. Um, but essentially, if you lose sufficient mass, the binary can completely separate. So that's one um, important way that systems that we would like to turn into X-ray binaries can frustrate us and, and end up uh, roaming off doing uh, living separate lives. Um, but the other important thing that can happen is that the supernova process itself can be intrinsically asymmetric and actually uh, produce a kick. Uh, and we see this kick um, both in uh, some of the models of, of supernova explosions but also in the spatial distribution of neutron stars and black holes on the sky that are sort of puffed out from the plane of the galaxy. So uh, we think typically there's kicks of order of hundreds of kilometers per second that happen in, in the process of a supernova. Um, and uh, such a degree of kick is important because um, the place where we find X-ray binaries most readily is in globular clusters. So this is a a picture of 47 Tuck, um, uh, a lovely image by Chandra here. And um, it's just every, every one of these points here is, well, I should say the majority of these points here are X-ray binary. Some of them are actually CPs, but um, uh, largely these are X-ray binaries uh, living in 47 Tuck. Um, all of those, unfortunately, turn out to be neutron stars. We have not found any uh, definitive uh, black hole in um, in a globular cluster yet. There are some potential candidates, however. Um, and those have been detected in quiescence and radium. Uh, so, uh, but this is also to say that in dense environments like this, something like 10% of LMXPs live in globular clusters. That's compared to about 0.1% of stars. So they're heavily overrepresented overrepresented in these dense clusters. So we think one of the reasons might be that in addition to this formation channel here that I showed you, there's dynamical inter interactions that can cause uh, a, a so-called dynamical capture, um, where three stars interact and two become bound to each other and the other one gets kicked, kicked out. Um, but importantly also, those, those kicks that I mentioned can also send an object flying out of the cluster. So I'll take a question here. Yeah, 
I'm just a bit confused about the setup of this uh, X-ray dynamics last mm -hmm. night. Sure. Just to make sure that I understand the system. Okay. So are you seeing that the systems on the right are uncommon? Uh, the one where the back hole is orbiting around the. Oh, and it'll look a little bit like this. So that probably, uh, uh, that's a great question. So probably this is, is actually relatively common for the early phase immediately after a supernova. Um, something that I don't go into here, but, but these systems turn out to have very strong tidal gravity, as, as perhaps you can imagine. And an effect of having very strong tidal gravity is that it will tend to uh, relatively rapidly circularize orbits. Um, so the, there are certainly some systems that have very eccentric orbits. Um, BE stars often have very, uh, well, it, without getting into the details, we think that older systems um, tend to circularize. And some younger systems, you might catch in this kind of a phase with a very eccentric. Okay. Uh, and to also make sure that I understand this further. So uh, on a system of an binary system, uh, are those uh, two sources stationary or are they are constant for this? Um, could you say that one more time? I'm not sure if I would. I mean, in banner systems, yeah. are those um, sources stationary or are they always? Oh, they are, they're orbiting about a mutual center of mass. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, generally in low mass x ray binary systems, the center of mass is very close to the compact object. But in a high mass x ray binary, like for SIG X1, for instance, um, it's you know it's somewhere that's relatively in the center of those two, so they they look like they're both swinging around on the sky. But uh, if you could spatially image um, a low mass X-ray binary, usually um, for a black hole system, and is usually what you would see is the companion star doing circles around the black hole with some very small perturbations on that. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I want to touch quickly on how we find new X-ray binary systems. And um, what's a little bit frustrating for those of us who are not around in the uh, golden age of X-ray uh, X-ray astronomy's um, discovery, the first X-ray telescopes being built, is that we have to play a waiting game. So we can't go out and find new X-ray binaries in our galaxy. We have to wait for them to come to us. At least currently, that's almost entirely how it's been. There's a very exciting recent discovery uh, by Gaia, uh, groups looking at Gaia data, where a black hole that had, was discovered um, from this kind of uh, uh, reflex motion of a companion star. But so far, there's been only one that's, uh, that's confirmed, and we, we hope there'll be more. But in general, uh, to get an X-ray binary system, you have to wait for a new X-ray transient to go into an outburst in the sky. So new systems tend to be transient systems. And any sufficiently uh, strong outburst in our galaxy has a very good chance of being detected. We are, uh, this, is, this is not true if you go from the Milky Way to even some uh, uh, neighboring galaxies in our local group. But for anything in our galaxy, um, we have various all sky detectors, Swift on that, Maxi on the space station, that are monitoring and detect new X-ray stars, send alerts to the community. And if any of you want to find out about these systems uh, when, when they're being discovered, um, you should sign up for ATELS, um, which uh, and click your interest is including um, transient events. And you will get alerted to reports of new transients going into outbursts or some familiar old transients going into yet another outburst. In any case, we must wait for, for new systems to become active, and there's usually a few here. Um, and what you do as a community is the first check is do we see pulsations or bursts? And so the initial claim is, is generally that these are black holes, and we want to see if we can falsify that. So if we see pulsations or bursts, we know we've ruled out a black hole, and this is very likely that a neutron star. Um, the other challenge is, can we find an optical counterpart? So that is, oh, yes, please. Uh, pulsations are um, sort of uh, very coherent, uh, really things, things like pulsars. So, so very coherent um, flashes of, of X-ray emission um, that are 
periodic in nature. And periodic in the one, two years, or shorter? Oh, over very short time scale. So um, within milliseconds to um, probably several minutes. Um, yeah, good question. So we um, we look with optical telescopes to see at the position of the X-ray source if we find uh, a brightened star uh, at optical wavelengths. Um, that being uh, an indication that th this new extra optical light is coming from the accretion disk, which is sort of enlivened by a new outburst. And now we know where to look for the companion star after the system has returned back to Cleosis. Um, I'll touch on this um, in, in the next few slides coming up. But once it's returned to quiescence, the goal um, when you can is you'd like to make a dynamical mass measurement, um, which is the gold standard for establishing, uh, 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 you know, this is the same way that exoplanet masses are measured. This is the gold standard, which tells you an uh, ironclad um, uh, definitive mass for a sort of system and importantly lets you distinguish often between a black hole or a neutron star on the basis of mass alone. Um, this is if something is greater than three solar masses. I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Um, there is no way to form a neutron star that is this massive. So as soon as it's a compact object above three solar masses, it must be a black hole. Um, I, and I just want to make the point that um, in principle, there could be black holes that are much less massive than this. In fact, any of them, an arbitrary mass. We simply don't know um, of nature producing black holes um, at masses that are, are, are much below this, but there could be such black holes um, uh, around it, and it would be very exciting to discover one. Okay, so uh, I told you that for discovering new systems, essentially we play a waiting game um, trying to find uh, a new transient. And very roughly, 70% of the transients that go bang turn out to be black hole candidates. So most, uh, and, and black hole candidates means we they show every character of being a black hole, but we haven't confirmed their mass. So they're, they're simply a candidate for being a black hole until we've measured a mass and proved they're a black hole. Uh, and what a typical outburst looks like is a rise time that is several days, a decay time that is months, maybe a year, and uh, recurrence time is often decades. So, and these the peak luminosity for um, such an outburst going off in our galaxy is usually of order or greater than 100 milligram. And for those of you who find this a very strange kind of unit to use, that's a fair point. Um, but the Crab Nebula um, is, is for a long time been one of the standard benchmarks, uh, the standard candle in. Um, high energy astrophysics. And it's one of the brightest objects in the X-ray sky. So 100 millicrad is already among the brightest objects that, um, that X-ray telescopes will be seeing. Um, and uh, again, what we wait for when something has gone into outburst to do the dynamical measurements is, is we wait for a return to quiescence, which is most of the lifetime before these systems. Um, so with with that, I now want to turn to some of those uh, mass measurements and show you how we do this. So this is, uh, uh, there's a, a lovely program um, by Rob Hines called uh, BINSIM, uh, Binary Simulator. This is showing you a, a system that's a particular favorite of mine called LMCX3, um, where this is actually, you know, uh, encoding correctly the mass, the relative scale, the period, um, you know, all the pertinent information about the binary system and its inclination. So, so if we had a, a fine enough telescope, in principle, we could watch this dance before our eyes and something very similar to what you see there. Um, and this, this binary dance is the thing that will let us measure mass. Uh, but before I turn uh, into those measurements, I want to just uh, briefly mention something about the equation of state of neutron stars. The equation of state simply refers to sort of the uh, the, the structure, um, uh, uh, how pressure is structured um, 
from interior to exterior of the neutron star. And there are a whole slew of uh, very nice Italian foods that uh, are, named, are, are used to name the different models for what these interior of neutron stars look like. Um, but in principle, uh, what we really are interested in is these curves here, which show you predicted relationships between radius and mass for different um, kinds of models for neutron star structure. And uh, what you should pay most attention to here is that um, the, the mass over here limit goes only up to about two and a half solo masses. And there's really only a couple of models that do this. And in fact, now these sort of models are significantly disfavored. So realistically, uh, a maximum mass for a neutron star seems to be something in the vicinity of two solar masses to be sustainable. Um, but an ironclad, uh, yeah, sort of uh, essentially universally agreed upon within the community, upper limit to the what a neutron star could hold is three solar masses. So if you've measured a compact object mass and it's above three solar masses, it is not a neutron star. Okay. So now let's talk about what do you need to measure mass? So there are three main ingredients. The first, I'll, uh, uh, it hopefully won't be too painful. I'll give you a brief derivation in a minute. Um, is called the mass function. And importantly, this mass function is a robust lower limit on the mass of the compact object MX. So this MX is what we're interested in here. Um, so we'd like to measure this. It comes from the radial velocity curve, as you'll see. The next ingredient that we need is a measurement of the rotational velocity. So V rho sine i. So this is another uh, observed quantity. Um, and the third ingredient is a fit to ellipsoidal modulation. Um, the amplitude of this modulation is a strong function of the inclination of the system. So uh, I'll take you through these, these three steps quickly. So uh, a derivation of the mass function, uh, this simply follows from Kepler's laws. So uh, if you relate the binary separation and the mass and period, you can uh, work through a little bit of, uh, of algebra separating the total mass into its components. Um, and you reduce uh, this mass function expression uh, which again is a lower limit on mass here. So m uh, sine cubed i over one plus the mass ratio uh, squared. This it, uh, depends only on period and k, which is the velocity sending amplitude. So these are two observed quantities that you can use to put a, a lower limit on the compact object mass. So that's a, that's a very powerful um, and very straightforward constraint. Uh, to do. So uh, to illustrate this, this is uh, probably the most stunning result. So this, this will spoil your expectations, but it's uh, it's too good not to show. This is A0620. Um, one of, in fact, the, the first system that was shown to have um, a, a, a mass function that was above three solar masses. So this is the first proof dynamically that black holes were real. Um, and this is a measurement of its uh, velocity curve. So, so a radial velocity curve taken over a few nights um, uh, work by Joey Nielsen here. And what you see is uh, uh, essentially a pure sinusoidal wave. And the semi-amplitude of that is you know, K, semi the velocity semi-amplitude. And the period used to fold this um, is 7.8 hours. So uh, putting these two things Together, you get a mass function that's about 3.2 solar mass. Again, first uh, widely accepted um, proof of a, a black hole existing. Um, that work was done earlier by uh, Jeff McClintock and Ron Remillard. Um, this, their data was not nearly so nice as, as Joe would see. Um, but uh, th this gives you a, a good sense of what you're looking for. And um, for those of you who maybe uh, spend time at SALT or uh, do optical spectroscopy, um, you want to have a resolution of a couple thousand to get a measurement like this. The next ingredient, oh, yes, please. Uh, sorry, could you just explain what you mean by the mass function? So is it the distribution yeah. of 
object masses. No, so uh, the so so their mass function also does get used in a different context as a term. But here, mass function is this f of m quantity, um, which is uh, just period time semi amplitude cubed uh, divided by a constant. And this is f of m is always uh, um, well, the mass of the compact object is always larger than f of m. So it's always larger than the mass function. So this is this is a convenient quantity used to give a robust lower limb bound compact object mass. Um, I couldn't tell you the origin of the term mass function for it, but it's sort of standard for, for folks doing these kinds of dynamic measurements. Other questions? Okay. So the uh, next ingredient um, is you, you need to measure uh, this rotational broadening. Um, this is really the rotational broadening times the sign of inclination. You can imagine that if you're looking at something um, that's sort of face on, so you don't, uh, you're not getting the, uh, uh, you're not seeing the broadening um, from one side of the star to the other from uh, Doppler motion. That that's very different than if you look at it uh, face on. So uh, that that introduces this sine i term, but this is really the observed quantity here. So what you do is you, uh, from your spectroscopic campaign, you figured out. This companion star seems to have a type that's K3, uh, K3B. So it's a main sequence K3 star. So you go out and you get a template spectrum. Maybe you observe one, maybe you get one from a model for the spectrum of a K3B star. And then what you do is you broaden, um, you apply just a, a Gaussian kernel to broaden this template until you get a good match to your data. And that gives you this V sine I term. Uh, and it turns out that this V sine i maps through um, uh, just the geometry of uh, a Roche potential system. It maps to the uh, mass ratio Q. So I'm not going to walk you through the nuances of how that works, um, but I will just tell you, and you can uh, check me later uh, looking at um, say work by uh, Jorge Casares or Jerry Rose um, that this holds. Um, but making these kinds of measurements, uh, I will point out, you need better resolution than you need to do the radial velocity. So this is 5,000 or better for a campaign like this. Uh, yes, and, uh, and here in red, this is showing you a Gaussian kernel applied to this spectrum here uh, that gives a good match to the data. The third ingredient is uh, fit to the ellipsoidal modulation to determine inclination. So this is showing you um, a fit to uh, 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 zero J sixteen fifty five minus forty. So the brilliant microquasar still on that black hole here. Um, and what you will uh, pick out by your eye is that over the course of one period, you have not one uh, modulation but two, and uh, the modulations are asymmetric. So that um, uh, I'll explain in a moment why that is, but the key now is that this mass function plus mass ratio plus inclination gives you the complete solution to mass. So I want to step back here um, and uh, yes, and show you've measured a mass function. It relates to m sine cubed i over one plus q squared. You now have all ingredients to solve directly for mass, not just place a lower limit. So those are the three ingredients you need. Um, to determine mass. So now let me explain quickly why do you see this uh, twice per period modulation and, uh, and what, what does that look like? So um, this little video is just to remind you of the, the motion that we're looking at. And if you cue into the companion star, you'll see that at quarter phase snapshots, you see um, images that look roughly like this. So when it is, uh, you have a sideways view, you get an elongated teardrop shape. So you have more surface, so you get something that is brighter. And you see that not once in the orbit, but twice. So you get two maxima in the orbit. And um, I, know I should point out um, this singly periodic signal here, this is the radial velocity signal that you would get as it's moving away from you, um, sort of neutral, then moving towards you, and then neutral again. 
So it looks periodic for the radial velocity, but again, for the, um, for the light curve, you will see something that is uh, doubly periodic. And another important distinction is that these two views, when it's, you have the, the apex of that teardrop pointed at you versus you're seeing the backside of the star, these do look very different from one another. When you're looking at the tip of that teardrop, it is so-called gravitationally darkened. So you get less emission uh, when it's pointed at you. And uh, conversely, when you see the backside of the star, um, the tidal force is, is pulled it in a little bit. So it's actually gravitationally brightened. So you get asymmetry between those. Um, and the important punchline is that the amplitude of the modulation that you see uh, is entirely dependent on the inclination. You can imagine if you're looking at something completely face on, what you see is actually constant. It doesn't show any variation whatsoever. But if you tip it more and more edge on, what you see is sort of even taking away uh, eclipsing effects, you see increasing differences between those quarter phases that gives you larger and larger modulation. Um, so uh, I guess I should pause here. Are there questions on, on this? Okay. Oh, yes, please. Yes. Uh, so when we are modeling the light curve for mass radiation, uh, to obtain mass radiation, uh, then when we do it for an actual case, uh, are we factoring in effects of the score and effects of, uh, for example, the third body uh, on the companion? Yeah, so often it is important to include a, a component of emission from the accretion disk, uh, which sort of acts as like a dilution term for the amplitude of that modulation, since you don't just have pure light from the star without any contribution from the disk. And sometimes including a hotspot, um, especially for a system that's more active, uh, a hotspot on the disk where the tidal stream impacts the disk, that can also be important. So uh, you're absolutely right that some of the models do take these kinds of things uh, into account when, when doing it in detail. Thank you. Uh, Jack, would you like to comment on the effects of the radiation on radio velocity curves? No, not at all. <laughs> no, uh, this is this is a good, a very good point. So, um, I, in general, what we try to do by picking systems in quiescence is avoid this complication. Um, we have. Uh, several measurements that have been done on systems that are bright and active uh, using absorption line spectroscopy have um, been shown to be incorrect. What's being measured is actually a velocity of wind instead of uh, a structure that is at the surface of the companion sky. So we really like to make measurements in quiescence when possible. I will uh, show in a, in a couple of moments a slide that touches on a technique to use when you have significant X-ray radiation. It's called the Bowen line fluorescence technique, which I'm I'm sure you're familiar with David, but um, for, for everyone, that it's, it's important if you do have a, an X ray active system um, to try to use a, a different technique. Uh, so, uh, well, actually, uh, it, it, so I, I won't get into the details here, but this is a system for which uh, David, it, we did need to use, um, be a little bit more careful in our modeling because it's an X ray active system. Um, and we did need to uh, remove some contribution from extra heating um, in performing this analysis. Uh, in any case, this is a, a black hole binary system, uh, LMCX1. Here's a, an image of its field. We in, in fact, it's one of the persistently active uh, high mass extra binary systems. So it has a, a known counter, counterpart. Um, and what we did was we uh, brought some telescopes to the Medellin, or brought, brought uh, ourselves at the Magellan Observatory um, and use uh, the mic spectrograph uh, with a, a slit place over LMC to make some measurements like this. This is showing you uh, red overlaying a model on top of the data in black. And you don't need to pay close attention to the different lines here, but it's useful to know that there are many lines that you observe. And all of these lines will shift together in synchronicity with the motion of the star over its orbit. So um, by making measurements over its orbit, we were able to get a, a not nearly so beautiful radial velocity curve as I, I spoiled you with before, um, but nevertheless, a strong constraint um, shown here in, uh, uh, in the solid line um, 
after correcting for the effects of irradiation um, in the, the dashed line. Um, we measured rotational broadening uh, by modeling out a template star and got very consistent uh, results using different lines, getting a, a measurement of around 130 kilometers per second. From the uh, ellipsoidal modulation, which you will note here is rather noisy, uh, we were still able to tease out um, a, a good constraint on the inclination. Uh, here, Jerry Ross uh, led this effort. He's, he's an expert in this kind of model, and also uh, recently has been doing a lot of exoplanet modeling with the same kinds of techniques. Um, and this shows you the kinds of uh, constraints you get on the dynamical parameters, um, including uh, most importantly mass, but also inclination, um, and, and also the other parameters that go with this, including the effective temperature of the companion star, the mass of the companion, um, and the surface gravity. So there's some detail that I didn't get into here. Um, in any case, uh, these turn out to be important ingredients for going about measuring the spin of the system, which is something I'll tell you about, not in this lecture, but tomorrow. Um, uh, yes, and uh, this is a nice little uh, cartoon of the system here with the sun the scale is a very unimpressive dot, and the very powerful winds of this giant companion star um, that are uh, shining on the 11 solar mass black hole, as shown here in this schematic. Um, so this is uh, the, the last thing that I want to mention here, but without getting into the details, is the so-called Bowen line technique. So I, I call this a black belt topic. It's not something that um, you necessarily need to retained from the lecture, except to know that if you need to, you should look up this technique for your system of, of, of choice. Briefly, um, there's a very uh, nice fluorescent, fluorescent process that occurs where um, uh, 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 nitrogen-3 is, is powered by fluorescence and then uh, decays to produce um, carbon and oxygen lines. And this Bowen uh, line shows up as a triplet and this triplet, uh, which is we, we know is a fluorescent spot on the surface of the companion star, we can measure the dynamics of this fluorescent feature um, for an X-ray active system uh, and use that to place dynamical constraints. So um, the, the first and the brightest object in the X-ray sky is SCOX-1. And it was, in fact, the first um, object detected other than the sun by Ricardo Giacconi um, this was sort of the, the system that gave birth to X-ray astronomy as a field, so it's, it's a very special one. Um, and this Bowen line technique was used to measure uh, its mass by uh, Danny Steve and, and Jorge Casares. So, for those of you interested in studying bright systems, measuring their dynamics, you should uh, file this away and look up the details of that technique. Uh, this shows you a trace of that uh, triplet as it's, as it's moving um, with the motion of the, of the star. Okay, so uh, I want to turn to some results, and um, these results both for because most of my work tends to be on black holes, but also because um, the uh, showing a, a distribution of masses for neutron stars is relatively less impressive. You'll get a sense of why uh, in a moment, um, but this is showing you um, a schematic of. Uh, <laughs> All the X-ray binary systems that had measured masses um, something like 15 years ago. So this, there are many new additions to this chart, but I, uh, I haven't uh, part of Jerry to, to update his, his map of the zoo here. So uh, that needs to be done. Up top are three, um, the three persistent systems. So these are high mass X-ray binary uh, black hole systems. Uh, the only one in our galaxy is the SIGX one. So there's there's two or the, the, uh, the well, uh, there's some in the LMC, but um, all we have in our galaxy is six one for a high mass extra binary black hole. The rest are all low mass extra binaries um, that are transient. And um, what you see here is an encoding of, of their separation, the size of the accretion disk, the inclination, the temperature of the companion star. All that information is here as a schematic for you. You can see the sun mercury separation for reference there. So these are close systems. Um, and uh, compiling results of 
uh, black hole transient systems uh, based on work uh, like I just showed you before. Um, uh, Ferriol Roselle several years ago led an effort to come up with a distribution for the, uh, the mass of, of black holes and, uh, and actually binary systems. So putting all of this information together with uh, uh, curves that, uh, that look like so, there ends up being a distribution for masses that is approximately shaped like a fast rise exponential decay, rather triangular looking uh, function here for black hole masses. And for neutron stars, um, with some, some recent additions that, that maybe broaden this slightly, there's a very narrow peak around one and a half solar masses for neutron stars. There's not much variance for, for neutron star systems. What's important to note here is that there is a very wide gulf between the neutron stars and the black holes uh, in distribution. Uh, so this mass gap is quite interesting because it is not expected. Um, you know, main sequence stars uh, show uh, sort of a continuous distribution that is in fact rising at, at low masses. So you would expect that whatever process births black holes, if it's um, if it's also uh, just purely based on mass, you would expect a continuation of this line downward, and in fact more low mass black holes than high mass black holes. That is not what we have observed. Uh, this is also not predicted by simple evolutionary uh, theory. Um, and we think perhaps this is telling us something about the super, supernova process itself. So maybe uh, something about a formation mechanism uh, that is distinct for high mass black holes uh, compared to lower mass black holes that we assume are probably produced, uh, but we don't observe in x-ray binaries. Um, so this is still mysterious. I would point out there are a couple of uh, black hole candidates which have been posited. Uh, there's indirect evidence that they're likely to have very low mass black holes in them. So this includes 4 u nineteen fifty seven plus 11, IGR-17091, but these have not been dynamically measured, and this, so this is still uh, in the realm of speculation to be confirmed. Uh, and with that, I'm going to move to my final topic, which is telling you a, a little bit about accretion uh, states and jets, and I'll turn more to that in uh, my lecture tomorrow as well. Okay, so um, the canonical, the, really the discovery of states and state transitions came about in the late 70s and early 80s, looking at SIGX1 as this prototypical uh, black hole candidate source, where they saw that sometimes SIGX1 had very uh, strongly peaked low energy emission. Um, so you see that here uh, in uh, this peak that's around 1 keV. Um, this is this was called a soft state because low energy uh, X-rays are called soft X-rays, and most of the emission was coming from these low energies. Uh, and other times, the emission was instead peaking at uh, much higher energies in the, the many tens of keV range. This became called the hard state. So this dichotomy, there are some nuances, some some other terminology which has arisen, but this broadly defines. Uh, sort of a, a state dichotomy that persists um, still today for looking at the behavior of um, extra binary systems. And uh, here is a, a view showing you um, hardness in uh, the bottom axis. So this is the ratio of high energy counts to low energy counts uh, versus count rate. So this is something like a Hertzsprung Russell diagram, but using extra parameters. Um, to map the behavior of different uh, black holes. In fact, this is all the black holes observed over the course of RxDE's history. Um, and uh, the color coding on these points, uh, I hear matched to the RMS noise in power density spectrum. So that's kind of a mouthful. Um, I, I, I didn't catch Diego's lecture yesterday. Uh, if he hadn't talked about that there, he probably will at his next lecture. Um, but broadly speaking, this uh, this RMS noise is roughly how much flickering there is over a broad range of frequencies in uh, 
in the black hole system. So it's an integration of the power density spectrum over uh, uh, a characteristic frequency range. Um, what you see here is that as you move from hard states on the right towards soft states on the left, there's a corresponding change in the rainbow. So you, you know, hard states look red here and soft states look purple. So there's structure not only in the spectral behavior, but also in the timing characteristics. Yes, please. Um, I just want to double check what you mean by the um, the RMS. So basically, it doesn't mean you, you make like a periodogram and see how um, see if there's like a strong signal, basically. Um, and if it's narrower, then it will have a low RMS. Mm -hmm. So it's showing like very periodic behavior. That, that, that's the right kind of idea, but it's a, a periodogram at all frequencies. So what you do is you're essentially measuring how much uh, amplitude of sinusoidal variation you have. Um, as a function of frequency for a, a large swath of frequencies. And when you take, you, you integrate that to take an average, that gives you the, the RMS. So this, this is not one strong single peak, but it's sort of a, 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 a an aggregation of the noise characteristics of the system at this range of frequencies. And so I, uh, I, I think, Diego's lecture should, should will probably touch on this and make some of that a little more clear, but this is essentially continuum emission or continuum uh, behavior in the power density spectrum. Just simplistically, it's the amount of scattered. Yeah, it, so yes, so in, in the light curve, it will look like uh, sort of a, a, a lot of scatter noise. So this is sort of where I refer to it as, as flicker noise. That's uh, at least my own mental mapping of how this looks, and that's that's exactly right. Um, yeah, and so now uh, again, this is an aggregation of uh, many systems, about thirty here, uh, and just to pick out one that's used as a standard reference for um, the behavior of, of uh, black hole systems. This is GX three three nine, and what you see is that if you trace the contours of its outburst. This makes something like a Q shape. Um, and in fact, all if you superimpose different Qs at different amplitudes and slightly different stretches, that sort of accounts for the, the fullness of this uh, diagram here. Um, and uh, this is this is really an aside, but um, I think this is an important note for those of you who are, are, are new to this, haven't seen this before, is that these hardness intensity diagrams are not um, sort of universal laws of behavior they're really dependent on the instrument that you use to make these measurements so um, this is showing where uh, a difference between for, for gx339 so the blue curve is exactly these points here so the rxte measurements of gx339 um, and in red it's the identical data points but just as nicer would see them and nicer has a different kind of energy sensitivity and what you see is that different energy sensitivity distorts the shape of this uh, of this Q shape uh, of this Q structure. So it morphs for a different instrument. And I didn't even include here the shifting that will occur in the hardness from one instrument to another. So I just wanted to caution: when you see a hardness intensity diagram, uh, you have to interpret it in the context of that instrument and how it's seen other sources. Um, but uh, so turning back to the more uh, physical view of this, um, this is, uh, I think, a, a lovely uh, diagram of the states that uh, was, was put together by Ralph Fender, uh, Tomas Colon, and Elena Gallo um, in 2004. And this, this has really uh, become sort of a standard fare for um, picturing black hole states. Um, uh, and this is often as, as you can maybe pick out with your eye called a turtle diagram because it looks like a smiling turtle face, roughly speaking. Um, whether it's a turtle or a cube or just a hardness density diagram in your heart, uh, that's, that's fine, no, no matter. Um, but what's important physically is I, I want to call attention to the rise in a hard state that you see here. So um, when a new transient emerges, it will often be in this hard state, rising in brightness then transitioning leftwards towards a soft state where it then falls in intensity and then swings right 
to return to a hard state. So soft and hard are marked here in blue and red. Things that are in the middle are generally called intermediate. And um, some people call uh, some parts of it soft intermediate, hard intermediate, and so on. But uh, most important are sort of hard and soft, and then um, and knowing the yeah. transition between. Um, what I didn't call attention to before uh, is, is this line right here. This is the, the, that I include. This is the so-called jet line. Um, and when the system going through its transition crosses this jet line, it does something really important sometimes. Uh, systems that are microquasars are called so because they eject ballistic, uh, so really sort of like a cannonball of jet emission that is launched at the time that they produce these ballistic jets. Um, I should point out that at lower luminosities, there's so-called compact or steady jets that are seen, which are of a very different character to these uh, are sort of um, much more uh, powerful episodic uh, ballistic jets. Okay, so this is, uh, yes, an, um, a famous view of uh, superluminal um, jet source GRS 1915, one of the wild black hole sources uh, that uh, Kyle is playing with. Uh, good luck. Uh, so th this is a, a, a view of its um, superluminal jets uh, ejected in, um, when it was first discovered in the early 90s. Um, there's a couple more slides on this. Uh, I want to point out to you that the sort of character of these Q diagrams um, tends to be very similar in the sense that things move counterclockwise uh, for, for most systems. Um, with, uh, I'll, I'll point out that where you don't see uh, sort of a rising piece doesn't mean that that didn't happen. It just means that if the you know, RC didn't jump to it quickly enough to make these curves. Um, but uh, rise in the hard state, transition to the soft, decay, Transition back, and so on. That's a pattern that is, is really sort of universal for these uh, for these outbursts. Um, but there are differences in, in the slope of uh, uh, of these lines, um, uh, sort of the, the transition states. Uh, these different slopes are thought to be largely predictive of the inclination. But there's not a clear enough mapping to give us more than a general sense of high inclination, low inclination, likely. We can't use this to say make a precision in the screen. Um, but this gives you a little flavor for some of these. Uh, uh, and for comparison, this is what you see with Aquila X1, which is a neutron star system. Um, unfortunately, it looks very similar. So when I talked to you before about a need to look for pulsations and so on, um, that's really because uh, based on simple characteristics like hardness, intensity alone, it's it's non trivial to simply make a, a spectral distinction or an, uh, a behavior distinction that, that tells you definitively if something's a neutron star or a black hole. Um, so you've got a lot of great feedback on this already from, from Dan and his talk. Um, so I won't spend much time except to say that our understanding of the states really comes from this uh, picture that is both simple and complicated. So there are two components here physically um, for a black hole. There's a, a disk, an accretion disk, which has a characteristic temperature that's maybe around a KDV, and this corona, which again, we don't have a uh, strong knowledge of its structure or location, but it's a cloud of hot electrons that compromises the thermal emission. So the interplay between these components is really what we think changes uh, most drastically as a function of state. And of course, if you have a neutron star, uh, instead of a black hole here, then you can have surface emission and um, some other uh, magnetic effects that I'll touch on tomorrow. Um, so the quick rundown is for hard states, you see these generally at lower luminosities. You're dominated by non-thermal emission from the corona. So this is the Compton component um, and, and reflection uh, emission, which uh, is, is produced by that Compton component. You also commonly see QPOs. Uh, so I'll explain this a little bit more tomorrow. Diego may touch on this uh, as well. Uh, there's uh, a compact radio jet in these hard states at high RMS timing ways. This is the splitter that we were discussing. The soft state is generally high luminosities dominated by the thermal blackbody emission. 
um, or, uh, or neutron star surface emission, there's no jet and there's low timing noise. Um, the uh, intermediate states uh, that are transitional between hard and soft, these tend to be pretty short lived um, and have a, a sort of a changing mixture of thermal to non thermal um, uh, behavior over the course of that swing in, in, in hardness. QPOs are commonplace there as well. Um, and ballistic jets, importantly, are launched in this transitional state. Um, uh, and just a quick reminder again that quiescence is where they spend most of their lives. And what it appears is that quiescence can be thought of as an extreme extension of the hard state. It's a lower and lower and lower capacities. So the main takeaways from this talk that I hope uh, you have at least enough information to uh, pursue yourself if it interests you, or at least to understand some of the language and papers and other talks, is uh, an idea of the taxonomy of X-ray binaries. So if someone describes a high mass X-ray binary, a low mass X-ray binary, you understand what uh, that's referring to. Um, uh, I hope you followed how Wiesen observations can be used uh, to, to measure uh, a mass function, um, how light curves can give you an inclination, and how you can put those together to get uh, a net mass and strength. Um, there's this mysterious mass gap that persists between neutron stars and black holes, and I think is the subject of much interest. Um, and for space, we see that black holes and neutron stars produce this Q or turtle head shape um, in their evolution uh, at, over an outburst. Uh, and, and as well, uh, there is strong coupling between the spectral states and the, the timing properties, which is why they're often called spectral timing states. Um, and not merely spectral states. Uh, so that's it for today. Tomorrow, I'm going to speak a little bit more about some, some of the physics behind these states. Um, uh, Dan already gave uh, quite a good um, uh, overview of some of the things that I want to touch on, so I, I may tweak a little bit. Uh, but I also want to tell you more about how QPOs uh, relate to the state evolution, and I'll touch on uh, black hole spin, which is something that I've worked on a lot myself. And, uh, very interested in. Um, I'll describe a bit more uh, some of the flavors of neutron star systems, uh, Z sources, H hole sources, X ray pulsars, and also touch a little bit on neutron star equation state. So if we have time, I'll, I'm happy to take a couple questions, but uh, that is it for me. Well, thanks, Dan. Three four slides back, the Here? Yes. So here there is a visible structure. Yes. It's formation. And below that, so what are those two uh, items? Ah, uh, yes. So the blue structure is um, is supposed to just highlight for you the uh, the soft state, and but the um, the arrow here is relating this uh, this. Uh, type one, the ballistic jet here, to this observation of GRS 1915, as contrasted to uh, the type two jet, which is a sort of um, maybe more like a collimated wind that's uh, in the hard state. So, so like, so there is like transition from hard state soft, and then they're coming back to hard. So, uh, I mean, in between, there are two, I can see two lines which are uh, not going oh, in the hard state. Oh, over here? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so sometimes um, I would say neither of these kinds of behaviors is especially uh, as common, but we do see sometimes there are little swings in hardness, and especially uh, this production of the ballistic jet. There can be some, some looping that occurs where multiple uh, ejections take place as there's a little bit of cycling at the point of transition. So it seems that sometimes whatever uh, change in the structure between a hard state and a soft state needs a few passes to sort of fully commit to being in a soft state. So that's what this, this loop is representing here. Um, and the, the smile of the turtle, sometimes you see excursions that get a little bit harder and then it uh, goes back, but it's maybe a, sort of an analogous attempt to go back to a hard state, but it's not ready to yet. So it has to come And this one quick question. So mm -hmm. in the very beginning, you had shown uh, the different schematics where uh, uh, after the explosion, it is possible that it may spiral around the elliptical orbit. 
and it can also get kicked uh, away from the system. Yes. So, is this the kicking is just a theoretical concept, or is it possible to operationally detect them? Um. So, when you make measurements of the dynamics of these systems, you can also get a measurement of the absolute velocity uh, in, in space for the binary. So, it's possible to compare its space velocity to um, other components in the galaxy. And so some groups have done this, Vicky Caligaro's group uh, notably, and um, the, it's consistent with there being different kicks, uh, but it's not, um, in, in a particular individual source, you can't say that in a yes or no. So thank you very much. Uh, I invite uh, you all 